In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This is how we're baptized, how we begin and end everything. It's so ingrained in us Catholics that we instinctively respond to it, usually with the sign of the cross, as y'all just did. It's also one of my favorite ways to quiet down a room full of loud Catholics. You just start the sign of the cross, and by the end, everyone has quieted up and is at least pretending to pay attention. But what does it mean? Truly, do we understand this name that we use for everything we are and do? That's something of a trick question. I ask like you're supposed to say yes, but the truth is that claiming to understand the Trinity is proof that you don't understand. By its very nature, the Trinity is a mystery. Not like a mystery novel with a clever solution at the end, but something that is in itself beyond understanding, an encounter. And it's not just any mystery, it's the central mystery of the faith. Yes, Jesus' life, death, and resurrection are the heart of our redemption, but the Trinity is who and what God is. Everything is founded on this truth. Without the Trinity, there is no incarnation of Jesus, no salvation, no existence at all. But to be a real mystery must mean there is something we can think about and talk about, something we can apprehend even if we cannot comprehend it. And that's the goal, to get some idea of this mystery of the Trinity and to see what this mystery means for how we live our lives. Starting with that act of faith, that teaching, there is only one God, period. One God. At the same time, this one God is three divine persons. The Father is completely God. The Son is completely God. The Holy Spirit is completely God. They're not three parts of a whole. One God, three persons. And we take it on faith, trusting in Jesus, knowing that God should be beyond our limited reason. But here's an analogy that might help us to think about this, so long as we don't take it too literally. The human mind, right? One human mind. But that one human mind has memory, reason, or thinking, and will, the ability to choose. They're all your mind, but they're not all the same thing. Your memory is not just a collection of past events, it's that awareness of yourself as something with a past and a present. In your self-awareness, your memory, you're also aware of your ability to think and reason. You are aware, you remember your ability to make choices, to act, to use your will. At the same time, when you use your reason to think about something, this includes your memory of the things you're thinking about. And it includes the choice, your will to think. And you use your will and memory in that thinking. Finally, when you do use your will and make a choice, a choice includes the memories and thoughts that led up to that decision. One mind, but three realities of memory, thinking, and willing, each of which are connected to the whole mind, but are not each other. But there's a difference. The Trinity is like this, but also unlike it. It's an analogy and not an exact comparison. Each person is fully God, but each person is also not the other person in the Trinity. Another way to talk about this in the simplest way possible is to ask two different questions. What is it? One God. Who is it? Three divine persons. Now, if all that makes your brain hurt a little, good. You're probably doing something right. If it seems easy, then you're missing something that's being said. Because the point is that we cannot figure it out completely. It ultimately has to be an act of faith. And this is the first application to our life. When it comes to knowing, loving, and worshiping God, we need faith. To put it negatively, the mystery of the Trinity means we should avoid worshiping our own idea of God. We all know people who do this. We've done it ourselves in some ways. People who have their own version of what they think God is like. It might be a well thought out answer, 
but you see that it's based ultimately on their own conclusions. I think God is like such and such. And if you pay attention, often they're describing some attributes of themselves. And when we accept the lie that we can come to our own conclusions about God, it's up to us to sort of figure it out, we've already gone astray. We might have some truth. Once upon a time, no one knew the truth about God, and a best guess was fine. But God has revealed himself. This is what Jesus is talking about with the Holy Spirit revealing the truth. That God is a trinity, a mystery of one God and three persons. To know, love, and worship God means submitting to something beyond our own ideas. The first life lesson is that really following God requires obedience and humility. Everything else is some form of idolatry. We should be baffled by the Trinity at least a little, and then rejoice in submitting our minds to that experience of our limitation in the face of God, who is infinitely beyond us. There's a reason that the saints and mystics will talk about an experience of God like an experience of darkness, that he's so beyond our understanding that they can't even face it, they can't even describe it. It's this image of darkness and infinite beyond. And so really, worshiping means encountering that, being overwhelmed and responding the only way we can, with a humble, I believe, I trust, I love. This is why the church is a must. Even Jesus says the Holy Spirit does not speak on his own, but takes from what is mine, from the truth, and reveals it. The church is an external guide to make sure that we are worshiping the true God as he is, rather than the God we make up in our own minds. The second life lesson is what it means to be a person. Since Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are each fully God, what is it that makes them different? They have the same divine nature, they are one God. So what distinguishes them? What makes them persons? The relationship to each other. And the same thing with human personhood. Being a human person is not just having a brain. That's just part of our nature. It's what we are. Who we are is found in relationship. In the beginning, we see Adam. He names all the animals, but he does not have a name for himself. He did not really know himself as a person until he saw Eve. And it's the first time he goes, ah, woman, and I am man. The existence of another person is what enables us to recognize that we are persons. Who are you? So-and-so's daughter or son, their sibling, mother or friends of him or her. It's not their opinions of you that matter, but the fact that you exist in a network of other persons, of relationships that point you to your own personhood. And ultimately, the relationship that truly matters, the foundation of your personhood, your identity, is the one God who is three divine persons in whose image we are made. This is why we talked about the connection between identity, the sacrament of confirmation, and the Holy Spirit last week. And these are truths beyond us, things we cannot bear now, as Jesus says in the Gospel. But having received the Holy Spirit, we are equipped to submit to this mystery of who God is, not just as an idea, but as the foundation that we use to understand the rest of creation and especially ourselves. Knowledge that God is one God and three persons should inform every relationship. And realize that we, that other people are not obstacles to being the person I am, but places to encounter what it means to be a person. Like mirrors, encountering others, loving them can show us ourselves. As the Second Vatican Council said, it is only in a gift of himself that man comes to know himself. So acknowledge the mystery of the Trinity that is beyond us. 
embrace what we are taught with humble faith, and then live in that love in whose image you are made, a love that does not seek itself, but finds itself precisely in being given away.